Hello, I'm Gary Quinn, and welcome to another episode of Ready, Set, Live. My guest today is Peter Angel, an American-European film composer, songwriter, record producer, arranger, and conductor. His style of composition is often a blend of British invasion, 60s Pacific Coast jazz, alternative pop, and new age. His credits include production, arrangement, and songwriting, working with new artists as well as established Grammy Award winning artists, including Charo, Sissy Houston, Barbara Streisand, and Thelma Houston. Don't go away, I'll be right back with Peter Angel. Hello, Peter. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here in studio, Mr. Traveling Worldwide Person. <laughs> well, thank you so much, for Gary, for having me on the show. Um, it's just great happenstance that I happen to be here at this time. So tell me, you know, I've followed your career and known you for a long time. And what I love about you is you're always doing innovative things that are retro, but they're cool, and you always have this cool vibe about you. Was this something you knew you were going to do when you were a young boy? I believe so. I think I began composing at the age of three, and either I was very good or very bad, but at the age of six, my parents decided to give me piano lessons. And so um, it was classical piano, but I was completely into the Beatles and all the British invasion of the 60s. So I um, wanted to depart from that. And, um, you know, so I've had a career in music ever, ever since. And now you are working not only on soundtracks, but you're doing a lot of um, Christmas movies, which not necessarily Christmas movies, but you're doing different artists. What I love is you're always finding new ways to perform information of singing with with new artists but also artists that you know bringing them back into the fold um, I love what you did with Charo mm -hmm. um, what has been your inspiration just for music was it always um, a sense of always breaking the mold or or what was what was the true inspiration well I mean I think <clears throat> you know, we were all pretty crazy about the Beatles, even though I was five, I was very precocious. And um, I think that's what sort of started off. And then, you know, uh, Burt Bacharach and Dionne Warwick. And, and I think just the whole thing of vinyl and having your name on a piece of vinyl and the pop music industry. Um, I always loved film soundtracks, uh, but I think initially my desire was to do records. And out of that, uh, several directors um, came to me to do scores for films, and that's how that developed. And then several of the films, because I'd done records, uh, they asked me to do the source cues, which are basically usually they put in old records, but I could do those, so I did all the source cues as well. Um, and then along the way, because um, I began as a songwriter, uh, composer, uh, but if you work with a lyricist that's not so good, you realize you need an insurance policy, which is, means you need to be able to write lyrics yourself. And then the same thing happened with arranging. After two of my songs had turned out badly, I realized, oh, I need to do arranging and then record production. Um, yes, I did a Christmas movie. Um, I've done some Christmas songs. I basically balanced my career between work for hire when people come you know, hire me, and then the projects that I'm interested in doing myself as an artist, and then I'll bring singers in, I'll bring musicians in. Um, so, for example, one of the soundtracks that is out is called Kiss Yesterday Goodbye. It's a 60s swinging London movie um, that doesn't exist. But I wanted to do a movie like that, so I hired an orchestra. I wrote 19 pieces of music for it. I wrote the synopsis, took production stills, and uh, now it's out. So when you listen to it, you can imagine the movie, but there is no movie. <laughs> right. So I mean, I'm always I'm always up to something, yes. and um, and I spent a lot of time in my childhood in Europe. So um, there's a lot of European influence, uh, Italy, France, England, um, and now that I'm living in many countries and working in many places, it's giving me a great number of musicians and varied things that I can work on and. Like I just recorded something with a singer in Venice, Italy. I recorded a horn section in the south of France. Um, so it's just, you know, you meet musicians in different places. Every musician singer has their own voice and you figure out the best 
people for the best things. A lot of times a singer, I hear the voice that inspires me to do a certain arrangement of a song I've already recorded before. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Yes, no, I mean, that's what I think about the great thing about traveling is that you get a piece of slice of culture in every country, and you've ha worked with many of the people that you were... Uh, Davide, mm -hmm. who was the, he was on the show here, sitting where you it, are. Amazing virtuoso violinist. Amazing, exactly. And Charo, mm -hmm. who was... Uh, <laughs> An institution. <laughs> yes. And still an institution. Yeah, she's so sweet. Yeah. Um, what has been the most important lesson you've learned so far in this lifetime? Um, do I get a couple? Yes. Okay. Because um, you said most important. I would say that um, don't give people what they want. Give people what they don't know they want yet. Mm. If you give people what they want, it's something they've already heard. And so you'll always be in the wake of someone else's success. So you give them what they want, but you give them a bit more that they weren't expecting. The other thing is, I think it's essential to be fearless when you're being creative. If you're thinking, oh, well, what are they gonna think about this or that? Um, you're second guessing everything and you don't get to really develop your unique style um, that should be different from everyone else's. Um, and then the third would be just um, always ask opinions, and then you have to cherry pick the opinions that you think will actually make your product better, because it's better to fix it before it goes out than after. So those are a few things. And I think, Peter, you know, I think creative people, they already have an innate talent, but sometimes they lose focus of not trying to be authentic, and they think, oh, that's what they want. And I think what makes uh, an amazing song, incredible you know, performance, is the authenticity of that performance being real. Mm -hmm. And what you just said is so important for any performer or artist. It's like thinking outside the box, but being true to yourself, mm -hmm. not saying, I'm going to be just like them. You know, because like you said, they've already seen it, they've heard it. Yeah, if you're going to be like other people, then you're a craftsman and you can do it very well. But what is the statement that you're adding to society? What is the thing that you're bringing in addition to what anybody else is doing? Um, you know, you may have success, you may have money and those things, but what has the contribu contribution ultimately been? What has been the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I have a very good answer for it. <laughs> um, the biggest challenge. I sometimes I, stump people with I these I, questions. I think it's to not lose track of the creativity by focusing on the business. Um, especially in the, this time with so much social media and oh, you have to have influencers and followers and all these things that all the time that the artists are spending doing that, they're not at their craft. and. You know, what was so great before is that people could actually make a living from their craft and they could do whatever they needed to do and they could practice for hours and hours or write, rewrite, rewrite. Um, but if you're so focused on how many followers you have and what you have to do to get this playlist and that, then you're not spending the focus of your time on the actual material itself. Yeah, absolutely. No. And, and, I think people in general, I think what's happening right now is we're trying to now, f everybody's trying to find themselves, especially during the last four years. And a lot of changes have happened for individuals, especially being in one location for a while and not being able to travel. Did you find that you had some realization of what changed within you during those four years? What's was it, important? Was and, it four years? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Seems like it was only yesterday. <laughs> um, no, I would say that you know, when things shut down, like when I'm not getting hired for something, that's when I get busy doing my own things. So mm -hmm. and during the course of the uh, pandemic, I recorded eight songs with Cynthia Kelly. 
Um, I found her on Instagram. I was really impressed with her voice and her guitar playing. And so the first couple we did were both, but then I flew to Kalamazoo to record six more songs with her because she was amazing. Um, I recorded a number of songs with Yuri Amis. Um, so I just got busy recording songs that I'd either written or new songs I was writing and working in the studio and not worrying about when the next work for hire was going to come. And just, you know, so that I was productive in that time. Who, who, who has influenced you uh, creatively or that you've had to, had the opportunity to work with or mentor? Um, some someone that you you loved. Has there been anybody spiritually or creative? Well, you know, as an artist, you're always being inspired by the best of things, and you're being warned by the worst of things. So, both of those things are essential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's great when you hear like, "Oh my God, okay, I, I definitely don't want to go there." Um, but I mean. I, you know, John Barry, I think, is a fantastic composer. Burt Bacharach, um, Henry Mancini, um, Ennio Morricone. Um, but then also, you know, performers and singers like uh, Dionne Warwick, Dusty Springfield, The Beatles, The Zombies, um, Aretha Franklin. I mean, who ever sings like Aretha Franklin? It's like she's one in a million. So there are people like that. And I think um, the commitment to... Uh, the integrity of the work. I mean, when I worked with Barbara Streisand, you know, she has a reputation of being a perfectionist. Um, but my experience was that she was a professionalist, that she was completely professional, completely consumed with getting the best thing possible. Not the perfect thing, but the best thing. And I mean, if you wanted anyone working for you, you would want them to give you the best thing. So um, I sort of... I can't say that I was inspired by that, but it was like a recognition, a touchstone of like, yes, you know, you always go for excellence. And if you know some part of it is not up to the other levels, then you need to take that part up so that everything is of equal part. Yeah, I think that's the thing with many good performers is they sometimes are so definitely this is what they have to do and clear. And sometimes people read that as being difficult, but they just want to make it sound and look real and, and, and up to their standard. That must have been interesting being able to work with her. Well, yes, but I think, you know, for example, I mean, it's one thing work for hire. In work for hire, obviously you want to be the best that you're going to be, but you have to collaborate with the people that have hired you. You know, it's not your thing, it's their thing. And so you use your talent to support them. Um, when it's your own project, you call the shots. So, you know, if she wants it a certain way, you're hired to do that. You know, if you were hiring me to make you a fireplace and I gave you something different than what you wanted, you'd be WTF. <laughs> <laughs> what makes Peter laugh? Oh, I think um, abstract absurdity. <laughs> you know, I think like the things that you just absolutely do not expect and can't believe have arrived on planet Earth. Um, those delightful, original, unique moments is what makes me laugh. Do you practice any rituals every day? Do you meditate? Do you do yoga? Do you do, is there anything in the Peter world that you say, I must do this every day before I start my day? I would like to say I do. Okay, but <laughs> full stop. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and you know, to be serious, um, I've done yoga, I've done meditation, I mm -hmm. go through periods, I've done journaling. Um, you know, I'm always reading. I'm always, um, I'd say, what I do daily is have conversations with people and ask questions and hear what people are thinking about. Um, I like to get a read on just what's going on in the sort of race mind consciousness of society at this time. I don't really read the news. I look at the headlines and I can figure out you know, the bent of the article. But it's really conversations. I get the most uh, from my conversations with people and all over the world. If you could go back into history and speak to someone and ask them a question, who would it be? And what would you ask? How many seconds do I get for an answer? <laughs> da, 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 da. Um, Anyone. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, uh, I mean, I can think of, you know, like, 
problematic people that would say, what were you thinking? <laughs> but um, <laughs> anyone in history, um, you know, maybe Henry Mancini mm -hmm. or John Barry, like one of, you know, one of the composers, the great composers, um, just ask them sort of what their work ethic is or what their thesis is on what is that they want to achieve no matter what the project is that they're doing. I'm um, just hearing um, from them what it is that um, is like at the forefront of, of their excellence. Um, I think, you know, something like that. What does the soul mean to you? The soul as in? An embody, embodiment of a soul, our souls. Well, funny you should ask. Um, I don't, you know, the lingo is so different. Um, when you say soul, are you speaking spirit? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, the container of our bodies and our identities, our sex, where we were born, you know, where we happen to just pop out. Um, and our experiences are all the container of our identity. Uh, but in essence, our soul or spirit, I'd say, is like the water in a beaker. You know, you, you move it around and you're looking at the beaker for so long, you, you get the impression that it's the shape of the beaker and then suddenly you pour it out on the surface and it goes everywhere. And I think too often we're trying to contain our spirit and what we believe is our identity instead of recognizing that no, you know, we're 90% stardust and it's the energy that we are and, and, and just be the water, don't be the identity, don't worry about trying to be consistent with what you think you are, people believe you to be. Keep going further, keep going beyond, don't just stay stagnant in the container of your identity. What does love mean to you? Love? Mm -hmm. Well. I think it's grace. I think it's. Uh, I think it's seeing. I think it's seeing someone for who they are or something for what they are, not what you would want them to be. What would be your one wish for humanity to change, or what would you say? This is what I would love to see more of. I would love to see critical thinking taught from kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I think education is where it all begins and unless you challenge young minds they're never going to realize what they can do what is your purpose now in life what's what's the ultimate mission of peter angel i would say to light minds to inspire um, people to question and to find delight in the adventure of what they don't know and discovering it um, to just think beyond to be um, curious and interested. Hmm. Perfect, Peter. Well, I thank you so much for this interview, and people can find you at peterangel.com, and they can listen to many of your tracks. I can't wait to hear the latest project you're working on. And I wish you such great success, Peter. It's such a pleasure to be connected to you after all these years and to see you in person. And I wish you great success all over the world. Well, thank you so much. And I am so excited to hear that you're doing writing and writing these kind of books that are going to be great resources for people that need touchstones to figure out how to move forward. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm Gary Quinn. Join me for another episode of Ready, Set, Live. Until next time, be well.